ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is 634 on Thursday, April 25th. I state the date because this is subject to replays on ACMI. So uh, on demand, you can see this anytime and play it three or four times because it's, it's a wonderful meeting. Um, our first item of business is a public hearing on school choice. Uh, this is a mandate by state law. Uh, and under the state law, uh, it, uh, I will note that what our policy is, it's the policy of the school district not to admit non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the inter-district school choice law, MGL 7612. The decision must be reaffirmed annually prior to June 1st by a vote of the school committee following a public hearing, and that's what we are doing right now. We have only one member of the public sort of in the audience, and that's Mr. Janger, so I doubt he's here for the public hearing. Is there anybody on Zoom who is wants to avail themselves of the rights under this public hearing to comment on our participation under school choice. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. I will now entertain a motion to notify the Department of Education, to notify the Department of Education that the Arlington Public Schools will not participate in the school choice program due to uh, lack of space in the district. So moved. Uh, second. Moved by Ms. Exton, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That is a unanimous 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Um, next up is public comment. We don't have any public in the room, and I don't see anybody on Zoom, so we can bypass public comment. And from there, we head on to the next agenda item, AHS student representatives to the school committee. And for that, we have Mo Hagenblue and Amy Kilaru. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, today was the last round of our inclusion and diversity workshops, um, at least from my experience and from all those what I've heard. It was really well. Uh, it went really well. The keynote speaker was awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jenga. Thank you for getting it. Awesome. Uh, we had a Mario Kart tournament. Uh, a what tournament? Mario Kart. Oh, Mario Kart. Yeah. Cool. Um, and there was 50 plus students and staff who participated. It was really fun. Um, we're glad to do something like that. Uh, there's an ongoing prom dress drive going on, and uh, the chorus and orchestra had their trip to Carnegie Hall. Uh, it's, do you know when they perform? From tomorrow night. Tomorrow night's the performance. Uh, junior prom is tomorrow. Uh, that's happening. Things are well, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really know. I'm not a junior. And uh, Eco Fair is happening May 10th, so get excited. Same thing as last year. There'll be snacks, uh, booths, all that, and music. So what do you do at an eco fair? So eco fair is a bunch of AHS students who are into the, the Students Against Violations of the Environment Club, the Garden Club, the Sustainability Club, all coming together with local environmental organizations like Black Earth Compost and Full Circle Compost. They're trying to like, raise awareness for environmental problems and kind of just rally people, town support for environmental causes. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be local businesses there, um, like solar companies there, and even baby goats. Baby goats. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? OK. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Thank you. Uh, next, the heterogeneous grouping presentation. Uh, Dr. Janger. So this, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So this is a relatively short presentation. We have a couple of new data points um, to present, then a quick recap um, of kind of where we are and how we got to where we are today, um, and then our recommendation for plans going forward. 
Um, so if you want to scroll down. So just to remind, and most of you have been here for the whole ride, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but this conversation about this particular pilot started during the year COVID years when we um, had heterogeneous grouping actually in m almost all of our ninth and 10th grade classes. At the end of that year, we looked at a lot of the different practices that we had done during COVID and wanted to see if there were any lessons learned or things that we wanted to continue forward. And there was a lot of positive feedback about heterogeneous grouping as being an effective and more equitable approach to teaching students. Um, so we then engaged in a research and study year, which went for the 21-22 year. That study group met roughly 10 times, then held a number of community forums, and finally made the, the uh, proposal to make a pilot in English 9 of heterogeneously grouped English. And heterogeneously grouped for folks listening at home means that all of the students in uh, the particular class, because this is a required grade class, take the same class, but students can choose the level of curriculum challenge that they're going to take on. Um, since that time, we have then made numerous presentations tracking the progress and continue to have conversations about that. And that leads us to today's meeting um, in which we're going to make a recommendation for next year. So scrolling up, the outcomes and evaluation that we have been monitoring have been levels of participation in the honors level curriculum. Um, students' grades in the curriculum, as well as surveys of students' experiences in the classes. We're also tracking future enrollment in honors, which is something we'll probably want to look at more closely over the summer because it's a complicated picture um, and present on future as part of a larger conversation about leveling practices and participation. And we will be able to look a little bit to see whether we're seeing um, achievement scores on the MCAS in English going up or down. How, of course, accepting that that's somewhat overdetermined. There's a lot of factors that are going to contribute to that other than the ninth grade English um, setup. So, scrolling down. So, here's what we have found um, the picture is a little easier to see, and then we, you can get the actual numbers when you look at the uh, chart, which is the next slide. But as you can see, honors level participation has been consistently higher in the years. Um, in the years during which we've had the heterogeneously grouped English. So the comparison years we've chosen are the year before and the year after the COVID experience. That's 2020 and 2022. Um, and if you look at them, the next two bars and the last two bars, those are semester one and semester two. And the reason both of those are there is because students in this program can switch levels in the middle of the year. We've had 17 more students opt to move up into honors at the semester break. Um, so the current, if you can scroll down so I can remember the exact number. Yeah. So if you see the current percentage is 76% of the freshman class is participating in honors level curriculum. And if you go back to the pre-heterogeneous grouping years, that's compared to slightly under 50% in the past. So that's a pretty substantial outcome in terms of students participating in higher level curriculum, getting more opportunities in terms of having transcripts that are going to look a lot more positive post-secondary. Um, so one of the questions, though, would be whether there is a problem with grade inflation or a problem with students not being successful. So we've been monitoring students' grades. You can scroll to the next slide. If you remember at the end of the first quarter of this year, Grades were actually a tick down. Um, the students have recovered since then. We've also cleaned up the data a little bit when we looked at it in the middle of the year. And so as you can see, the grades currently are slightly up. My basic argument would be the grades are the same. Um, that we're not seeing the grades are dropping. We're not seeing the performance is dropping. And one of the things that then we ask is what's going on with the standards in the classes. And one of the things that we've been really careful about in this program, the teachers have been meeting as part of common planning. The teachers have been comparing their work. They're measuring students against the same standards on the same curriculum. So these grades are reliable measures in as much as grades are measures of student learning. So the bottom line is what we have seen over these last one and three quarter years is a significantly increased participation on his level curriculum. We've seen that as a positive impact across all the demographic focal groups. 
um, and then maintained grades and participation, um, again, across all of the focal groups. Scrolling on, so that's just the numbers. So just as a reminder of why we are doing this. So the biggest reason is because inclusion is a primary value and equity is a primary value of the Arlington Public Schools. The legally, ethically, and professionally, having students in the least restrictive environment and included and grouped together as much as possible is what we try to do. Now, um, there are times when if students are taking um, content for which they don't have prerequisite knowledge um, or that they don't need to take, there may be diversions of the students. But in these levels where it's possible to do this as much as possible, we're committed to inclusion. We had evidence of effectiveness during the pre-pilot um, years that led, and we had evidence of disproportionality not only in participation, in grades, but in student experience. And we believe, and we've seen some evidence of these equity and mindset um, improvements for students, because what we are saying to students is that we believe that more of them can achieve at a high level. And we are seeing that in the fact that more students are participating. And lastly, heterogeneous grouping, just to remind people, is not a novel practice in Arlington. Heterogeneous grouping is practiced in a lot of junior and senior classes, a lot of standalone classes, so teachers have experience with it. Um, our systems are experienced with it. It's something that's reflected in our GPA and grading practices. So we can scroll past that. That's just a reminder of what we went through to set up for this. So where are we now? Um, can you scroll down one slide? I think they're in the wrong order. No, go down. Go down one more. Yeah. So yeah, go up one more. That's where I want to be. <clears throat> Nicole was right. They're in the wrong order. So what do we want to do? So first, we are asking to continue this practice in ninth grade English for next year. We think it's been successful. The students, the teachers are prepared to do it. And that's something we want to continue doing. And then what do we want to do going beyond that? We are already doing what we're calling enlarging the conversation. The English 9 teachers had a panel with all of the school um, at our last staff meeting. And we talked about how honors expectations and leveling practices and grading practices can be aligned to create more equitable outcomes and the impacts they're having. There are a lot of directions in which that conversation can go. It's something that ties into our strategic plan. It ties into our work around equity. Um, it ties into our work around deeper learning and academic conversations. Obviously, as part of this process, we also want to complete the pilot evaluation. So over the summer, we're going to be obviously gathering the final grades for 2024. We are conducting the spring panorama survey. We're doing a parent survey, which parallels that. We've added some questions into the panorama survey and the parent survey that get at some questions that we had last time we did the panorama survey around engagement and um, uh, it's teacher expectations. And obviously, we're going to track this question of future enrollment in honors and achievement in MCAS scores. So if you scroll up. So when we enlarge the conversation, this ties this small pilot into all of the work that we're doing right now. So you know, a reminder that with the strategic plan, with the working groups, with the work of our ILT, things that we have been working on in different places around the school are belonging in SEL, deeper learning, academic conversations with the staff, reading the book and doing learning walks around the book in order to create interdisciplinary conversations, and more conversations about how we can increase inclusive grouping. So one of the things that we did at our last faculty meeting that we're going to do at our next faculty meeting as we finish up the learning walks and that the ILT is going to do over the spring and the course of the summer is to plan our PD and our conversations so that we are bringing these threads all together in terms of creating more equitable options. So now scroll down to. So these are just examples of ideas for PD groups and working groups that have been proposed for the next year. That conversation will be refined. But for example, looking at aligning expectations for honors and A grading and curriculum across the grade nine and within disciplines. So one of the things that this process has surfaced is that we need to be really clear about what honors and A expectations are, that when they are aligned equitably, you will get better outcomes for students at both levels and you have more opportunities for students to move back and forth. 
looking at equity impacts of different departmental leveling and tracking practices. And so we've looking at other ways to increase participation of all students and both within the focal groups of upper level curriculum as appropriate. Um, and then one of the things that we've been working on this year is to look at the explicit teaching and practicing of academic conversations within the department, which is a deeper learning focus. And then explicit teaching of things like SEL and um, executive functioning. So that's the whole presentation. Um, those are just some sort of key resources as I post these things. If people are looking to go deeper into any of the data um, or into any of the things, they can go back through the data that we have there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Singer, for your presentation. So first, um, I am in favor of continuing the program as, or the pilot as you've outlined, but I'm just wondering when we're going to get some of this important feedback and, and actually see it, because I know we've kind of been waiting for it for a while, specifically the parent survey, um, the panorama survey, and also the future, how people have been doing in terms of 10th grade enrollment in honors courses, because we brought that up in October, um, and you know, you have at least one year where we could look at it and say what it looks like versus uh, 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 back in 2020 or 2022. So last spring, I presented on the panorama data and this parent survey data. Um, and in the fall, we explained that 65% of students are doing honors in um, English 10 right now. Okay. It was not in a slide that I'm aware of because um, I've got notes from then that uh, Mr. Shulkman had asked about it. So I think we'd like to see, that's part of the information that I think we'd like to see going forward. Sure. Just mm -hmm. to, to show how it's made a difference. Um, but I, I know that we had the survey last year. I think there were concerns that it didn't necessarily get at how parents, how some parents felt about whether the honors was challenging their student enough. Um, and I think that's always been the question about this entire pilot. And so I'm hoping that we can get some answers about that. Thank you. So, We can try to present on this again, and we can go deeper into it, but the panorama survey asks these questions, right? If you go back, uh, I need to figure out which of these slides to pull up, but if you go back to the spring data that was presented to the school committee last year, which I'm pulling up It was up in now. June. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the spring data, the panorama survey, we have students re reporting Positive classroom climate, pedagogical effectiveness, rigorous expectations, teacher and student relationships, classroom mindset, and classroom belonging. Those are all unchanged from previous years, and those are all in the upper percentiles compared to other classroom surveys okay. at the high school level. It's especially the parent data that I'm interested okay. in. Okay. Okay. Um, I can report on the parent data. I will say that the response rates amongst the parents were pretty low, but we will we are submitting a survey this year where we're asking those questions. We will get that information. Okay. And we'll have that for you in, probably in the summer and fall. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Ah, Ms. Morgan. Um, so I have a question about the, um, I, I appreciate all the data and I, my interest has often, well, always been on sort of what this actually looks like in practice, like how does this look and feel in the classroom? So um, if there were students, so students are in, an, in a heterogeneous English class and they have been assigned a group project um, and there are students in that group who are taking the class for both 
honors credit and curriculum A credit. And those students in that group are being graded on a different rubric because one's like, some of them are taking it for curriculum A and some of them are taking it for curriculum H. How does that work when you're doing group work? Nicole, do you want to answer that question? So I think it depends on how, um, what the assignment is and what the requirements are for those for that particular assignment, as well as um, how the grouping is happening. So if um, being strategic about whether uh, students are choosing their own groups, um, if they're being put into different groups, um, I know for different assignments, you, we do it different ways in terms of the grouping. Um, and then for sometimes there's there's other components, like for example, I'll have, um, I was talking for specifically for like a group project, Miss mm -hmm. Morgan. Yeah, yeah. So I think it, there'll be different components for it. So for example, if I had, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe if you're doing it for A level, you're, you're answering perhaps a different prompt. Like if they're doing an artist, let's say they're doing an artist statement, right? Like I usually have them, if they're putting some sort of creative project, um, they're each working on the creative project in a certain way, but I always have them do an individual component, like an, an artist statement, which would be an analysis of their, of their work. And that prompt would look for, for my class, like that prompt would look different. It would ask them to be doing, and I'd be asking to assess certain things, not more work, same level of work, like same page. I mean, it may come out to be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, depending on conciseness of the writer. Um, but the question and the prompt would be different. Like I'd have them look for different things where I'd have to be pulling in multiple sources if you were perhaps doing it for honors level where you're working with one source in that artist statement if you're if you're A level. Does does that make sense? I usually I have like an individual component with the overall. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers I, I your mean question. I, and I don't, you know, I, it's not necessarily that everybody certainly does it the same way, right? I guess the feedback that I would provide um, as somebody who does spend a lot of time with a variety of, of ninth graders, um, is that the the group the group work is really is really tricky um, mm. in terms of how it's ultimately assessed and evaluated. I have heard from students they've said, well, you know, I was doing this project and so and so is taking the class for curriculum A and they didn't have to do this part of the group project, so they just didn't do it. So I mm. had to do all of it, and so the reaction of the student was like, I don't ever want to work again with somebody who's taking the class for curriculum A credit because I ended up having to do all of this stuff so that I could meet the criteria for this grade, which is like 100% not the outcome we want to have, right? Like that's not, but, but you can, you can see how 15 year olds, when they look at something and like these, you know, group work in a class where 75% of the students are taking it for honors credit and there is this contingent that's not, but we want to have, the whole point is that group work is heterogeneous, right? That you have that 25% of the members of your group are taking it, are, are you know, so it, that is something that just in talking to students this year, especially, um, has sort of stood out to me as an, as an area where more conversations could happen or it, 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 it just feels really tricky when in a lot of the situations, the sort of the difference between the levels, which is not the focus of the, the pilot, right? But it, but the, the difference is like, oh, well, you get more points for this or the rubric looks like this or whatever. It becomes very tricky when you have kids across levels working on groups together when really like we want to make that group work that where it should be where like the robust conversations are happening. And that's like part of the whole point of doing this is that we have those heterogeneous groups, not only within the classroom, but within group cohorts as they're doing their work. And it it. It's it's tricky to figure out how to structure the assignments to do that in a way that makes sense for everybody, I guess. So. Can I? Dr. Dr. Elements. So I, I hear what you're saying, right? And group work, um, different expectations for different students, grading practices are something anecdotally. I have had three kids go through the high school. Um, I know a lot of children. 
It's, it's something that's true in any class, whether the class has heterogeneous grouping or whether the class doesn't have heterogeneous grouping. And so while we will have these anecdotal things where kids will say, like the mechanics of the grades are, are funny things to explain to other people, I think what's really important for us to do is to look holistically at like, what does the data say? And so if, um, I actually, Nicole, because I can't show things on the screen, but I went back to the survey data that we have from last year. Um, and there are two uh, sets of slides. One is the survey data from the students, and the other is the survey data from the parents. Um, when we ask the students, in this class, how much does the behavior of other students help or hurt your learning, there is no change, right? So while sometimes other kids are annoying, sometimes things are difficult, differentiation can create um, stresses between kids, Having kids have a growth mindset versus a competitive mindset, all of these things are challenging things. These are the realities of being a teacher, especially in an environment where we grade kids on things, you know, we don't, which is just not the joy of learning. We also sort and rate kids, and so there's that whole, um, you know, mechanical thing. But what we find is that the response was one, the same, and two, um, seven, eight, thirty, thirty-eight. 38. So 48 percent of students said that the other students in the class helped their learning. That's the same as it was before. And only 3 percent of students say that other students in the class harm their learning. So this is an environment where the presence of other students who are not necessarily as academically able is not hurting the vast majority of students and has not changed from the general experience of students. So that's a positive outcome when we are now giving students a more diverse experience. Um, so then the other thing, I don't know if, um, Nicole, are you able to grab the heterogeneous English pilot caregiver feedback results? I just shared them with you in your email because Liz, Liz told me that you can share them on Zoom. I can't. Okay, I'll check. Um, so we had a fairly small response on that that's only something like 50 parents out of 744. Um, but if you look at the results that we got last year, we hadn't done a survey, so we don't have a comparison. They are generally positive. So sense of belonging overall, how does your student feel like they belong? 56% of students, 57% of students were one or two above. So it's a five-point scale, so we're positive. If you look at classroom climate, we did it on a scale comparable to the one about other students. How positive or negative is the overall classroom climate? Um, six, 17 percent, 38 percent, 19 percent had those all together answered positively. If you ask um, overall how much does the behavior of other students hurt or help, um, the parents, 12 percent, 9 percent, 21 percent answered positively, and 12, 16 percent answered negatively. So the parents answering have a more negative impression than their students do, or than the students answering do. Engagement overall, we have 66% um, answering that their children are interested in the English class. Um, and mindset, so it's, it's again, positive towards the growth mindset that they can change their behavior. Rigorous expectations, you have 30 46% answering positively and 16% answering negatively. So overall, the response of the responding parents is towards the positive. Are there differences of opinion? Yes. Do people have different values in this in terms of how they want their students' education to go? Yes. We have to make an overall impression about whether this is better or worse. And what we're seeing is a positive impact in terms of the things that we measure and not significant negative impact. And I have just one follow-up question. Go so for why it. aren't we, so we're at a place where 75% of students are taking this for honors credit. So why aren't we here making a decision to just do a, an honors English class for everybody next year? So I think there's a few reasons. Um, one, I would start with the reason, the sort of dominating reason why we chose heterogeneous grouping the, the determining factor for the study group was what was expressed by the students, which was that their preference was to be able to choose their level of challenge. So that was number one. Number two, um, 
a throughout the rest of our school we have in the academic in the academic strands, right, math, English, history, social studies, world language, we have levels. And those levels are represented in GPA and they're represented in weights. That's understood by colleges, it's understood by the teachers. To have one of those classes be honors for all would be a completely different theory of sort of how we structure things. These teachers um, did not feel like there was an advantage given the way they're currently teaching, which they're finding success with. Um, in terms of going to that. They didn't think that that would be a better option than giving the students the choice and they understand how that system works. So I think if we wanted to unlevel as a school, if we wanted to move towards an honors for all unleveled model for the school as a whole, that might be a conversation to have, but that would be shifting our theory of how we do our, our you know, challenge and expectations in the class. Okay. It I just wonder if it would be more authentic to what's actually happening in the classroom. That, like, I'm, I'm sort of increasingly uncomfortable that 25% of the students who are in English 9, um, who are still disproportionately students of color, students on IEPs, we, we you know, they, there are still more of them in, they're disproportionately represented in the 25% who aren't getting the, honors credit for the class, it, it, I just wonder how, if they aren't truly doing honors level work, that we're not giving them the GPA and the credit for. Like, But I think what we've discussed is that they're not doing honors level work. They're not being asked to do honors level work. They're being asked to do, I mean, as, as Nicole was saying, they're being asked to do, the teachers have understood these at different levels and different expectations. Students clearly understand that there's a different expectation for some of those groups of students. Um, and when those students demonstrate the capacity to do honors level work, they switch halfway through the year, as 17 students did. Um, so for those students who are choosing for reasons of stress and expectation and where do they want to go, to do a college preparatory level of work but not an honors level of work, giving them that option is, con you know, is consistent. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thanks. So I've been looking at the survey data that you're talking about too. Um, and one thing I think is, oh shoot. Um, I am, I think what gets to my concern is the data point where looking at the parent survey. So first I had a hard time correlating what the numbers meant because I didn't realize they were referencing the panorama thing. But if you look at the rigorous expectations for the parents versus the students, um, the so panorama counts anything other than encourages me quite a bit as a negative. So if you take those for the students, you get 17% um, of the students felt, fell in the negative bucket for encourage. Does this teacher so, encourage you? Panorama doesn't report anything as negative. They only report what's positive. And there's the middle, which is neutral. And then. They're, okay, so I'm looking at their color coding them as red versus green. So okay. that's what I meant. But the, the buckets are, encourages me quite a tremendous amount, encourages me quite a bit, encourages me some, encourages me a little, does not encourage me at all. If you count, and the numbers that you were quoting before were encourages me a tremendous amount and encourages me quite a bit. For so parents. the other buckets total to 17%. So that's some or less. But for the parents, 42% or 43% of the parents fell into the encourages me or encourages my student some or less. And whether they're, so that, that's the discrepancy that I'm concerned about, that this parents are feeling that somehow the work that their students are doing isn't, I mean, it, this is coming under rigorous expectations, and I think it correlates with the parents are concerned that the, the students aren't doing rigorous work, so. So That's there are 50 parents who answered. 
Yeah, I, I realize of it's... Of those 50 parents, yeah, yeah. they don't agree with their students. Right. That's an interesting finding. I, I don't know what to say about it other than the okay. sur surveys or something like that. Okay. Anyone else? Um, Ms. Exton. Thanks. Um, thank you for this presentation. I, so what I heard you say is you're here to sort of ask, uh, you'd like to continue the, the pilot. I guess my question, I'm not sure it's who it's for, but when do we get to stop calling this a pilot and sort of, um, you know, ninth grade English is heterogeneous and I understand that you're going to look into how it might evolve from here, but, um, you know, we, we approved two years ago for a two-year pilot and that's coming to an end and so I just, as one who supports it, I would be interested in the opportunity to stop calling it a pilot and we have heterogeneous ninth grade English and, um, you know, you and your team will continue to explore what that looks like and all of these PD and ILT works that work that's going to continue, but um, something that it seems like AHS is, has been working on and is, feels successful about and maybe a pilot is not the right name for it anymore. Anyone else? I'll, I'll just add, follow uh, Ms. Exton's uh, lead. Uh, in that everything I've seen about this pilot is that it's been successful. <laughs> and certainly by coming in to talk to us tonight, you're saying we should keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, so we're not going back, but uh, how are we going forward? Is there any reason why we're not taking what we're, we've learned in ninth grade English and broadening it out elsewhere? Um. So there's two answers. I mean, one, I don't know that we, I, we, are, we have not done the preparatory work in ninth grade world history, ninth grade physical science, mm -hmm. which would be logical next steps. Mm -hmm. um, and we have not, to be perfectly honest, felt the support from the school committee for um, ambitiously moving it forward into 10th grade mm -hmm. English. Um, we would like to continue the practice in ninth grade and like I said, we'd like to broaden the discussion. I think for us, as we have a conversation, there is work to be done. There is good work and valuable work around honors and A level expectations, mm -hmm. um, making practices more consistent around uh, within terms of curriculum alignment that will make the experiences of students more equitable across the levels. That's where we want to start. That would, I think, if this committee um, is supportive of moving towards more inclusive grouping in the future, make that an easier move to make. Okay. Um, and so that's the work that we want to do next. Okay. Do any of our student reps want to discuss ninth grade English? You seemed interested. I've, I'm in a heterogeneous English class right now, and I've only found that it increases participation all around. I think people are less... Um, competitive and like watchful of what they say, which I really appreciate. I think it makes discussions a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else under this agenda item? Seeing none, let me just uh, be remiss at the start of the meeting. I should have announced who's here and who's not. Mr. Cardin and Mr. Thielman are not with us tonight because they've got work commitments that uh, ran afoul of this this meeting and Ms. Homan, uh, Dr. Homan is at a celebration and our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Mona Fort Walker is here in her stead. Um, and Jenny Medeiros is here for the AEA. Um, which leads us back to Dr. Ford Walker who will be presenting the super, oh, we've got a finance report first. Yeah. Finance report, Mr. Farias. Sure. Point of order. Oh, point of order, go ahead. Do we need to approve the pilot for another year? I don't know that we do. Um, if you'd like to make a motion to support going forward, uh, continuing the program, please do. Okay, I so move, because I'm not sure if we do or not, and at least this way we do. 
Do I okay. Do I second? Okay. Second. <laughs> Motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded by Ms. Exton to support continuing with the pilot in the ninth grade next year. Mr. Uh, Dr. Changer. Point of clarification. Are we moving forward on continuing a pilot? Or are we moving forward on continuing the practice of heterogeneous English 9? Uh, Ms. Morgan. So I think in the past, the superintendent has brought us a recommendation that mm -hmm. we have then voted on, right? So that's where we're a little, like we don't mm -hmm. have that on the yeah. agenda, we don't yeah. Have, we don't have that, mm -hmm. right? So I, right. I, so. mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know what her recommendation- I understood that the reason that I was coming to this meeting was to make that recommendation. Mm -hmm. And so your recommendation is, is that we continue the practice of heterogeneous grouping in English 9. The practice of heterogeneous grouping in English 9. Correct. And that would be your motion, Dr. Allison Ampey? Or do you want the word pilot in there? I was looking at our agenda in case it explained, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I make that motion without oh. the word pilot. Without the pilot. Um, with uh, Dr. Jenger's language, to continue yeah. the practice next year. And Ms. Exton, that was your second. Okay, uh, any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed, abstentions, that's a unanimous six nothing vote. Keep on keeping on. Thank you. Five. Five, 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 five. yeah, we're, and I'm a licensed math teacher in the state. Problem is I can't see over in that corner. Um, okay, Mr. Farias, we're now to you for the real math of the night, it's the, uh, it's the financial report, number four. Okay, so um, I'm going to just start. Um, so this will be the updated financial report as of March 31st. Uh, the most recent one we had was of March, uh, March 13th. So this is more of like a two, three, two, three week update. Um, I follow the same logic, which ho hopefully is easier to uh, follow and understand. Um, sorry. Um, it starts with the general fund report um, and some of the some of the. Uh, Columns are broken up into original budget, transfers, um, revised budget, uh, expended column, and encumbered. Um, and then another column we have for projected expenditures, which is what we project to occur until the end of the year. Um, so these, the, this figure hasn't been posted yet, so this one can be uh, subject to change. Um, and the projection assumes that departments and schools are going to fully spend down their budgets. Um, one thing I want to note some updates you see that were reflected here compared to last month is that some of the transfers um, that we recommended, excuse me, that we uh, su suggested uh, were, went through, such as the transfer to the athletic fund, the monotony revolving fund, uh, traffic supervisors, <coughs> transportation, and another one for facilities. And the one we have pending is a 200000 for um, curriculum related expenditures. Um, one thing we I am look out for until in, in the year for right now is still the um, increase, the possible increase for electricity, and it's something that I do project and I can um, show you down the line. And because of the transfers we, we put in place, um, I still expect the projection to be uh, pretty similar to what we did last uh, last month during the, the March 14th um, financials. Um, so if you go to page uh, three. Um, I'll, I'll skim over this. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, one thing I want to emphasize or make note of, some projected expenditures that are pretty large will be the uh, other stipends, which is uh, line 510322. Um, I projected about 128000 which should be enough to cover some ILT stipends we have in addition to any other stipends that haven't been processed on our end. Um, that, that, you'll see that on page 4. Um, another projection that I have I mentioned earlier will be on page, um, excuse me, on page page seven, which will be line five twenty six to eight for power electricity, and that's I have projecting about four hundred thirty thousand. Um, just just again to emphasize, um, all of this for object code is for the general fund expenditures, and then starting on page, sorry, move pretty quickly. Um, starting at page eight. Uh, will be reports for the all revolving accounts. Um, the revolving accounts for this, it's it's pretty it's it has similar columns to the 
the object code, but the difference here is that we break it down into, excuse me, it's broken down into a couple less columns. The columns here are just uh, budgeted amounts, actuals encumbered, and then and projected amount. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that the negative numbers on the report doesn't really ne doesn't um, represent a deficit. It's just more about cash balances because where we reflect revenue. Um, so we start with athletic fees, then I move down to monotony, followed by building rentals. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is you'll see the projection for building rentals is still about, it's pretty high, about $400,000. Um, and that's something we should be addressing the next month or so. And, and that's more when we start charging uh, rent to some of our after school programs in addition to community ed. Um, after that, well, this, this is it for uh, Pierce, Pierce Field, um, the, our tuition payments, um, and then our foreign exchange tuition, followed by um, the Bishop bus revolving. Okay. Um, if I'm going too fast, let me know. I can slow down. Or if you have any questions, feel free. I'll entertain questions or from the committee. Um, Ms. Morgan? Um, can, if, if we have some questions about like how some of these, like is it possible to get an updated report if some of the, with some of the adjustments like the, it looks like that the line for transfers is like four hundred and one thousand dollars, which I'm not. Yeah. Like, is it is it possible to like do another pass through and then give us an updated one, just like making sure that some of those things are are reconciled so that we can take another look at it before the next reporting? Sure, sure. It's, um, just to clarify, so you want like a copy of the transfers? Of well, we no. So. The the four hundred and one ninety eight, or four four hundred one nine eighty one. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why that's not four hundred thousand. Sure. So um, one thing I, I noticed is that it, sh it should be four hundred thousand. But I noticed that in our statements as of October, there was about uh, about nineteen nineteen eighty or so transfer there, and I'll find out what that is, and I'll can follow sometime tomorrow. Great. So and then if. Yeah, and if that impacts any of the other areas or if there's any other things that you're you're kind of looking at, if we could just get sort of a fresh one of this one so that it gives us a starting place when we look at report number four, it sure. would be mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and then after, after grants, going back to, um, oh, okay, sorry. Starting in page, uh, tw starting in page twelve is, is some of our grants. Um, some of the revenue you'll, you'll notice is is, an, is still projected there, and that's mainly, for example, Title One, and that's mainly because we haven't drawn down the funds due to expenses. Um, but once we start drawing those funds down, those balances will start decreasing. Um, the first thing we start with Title One, followed by Two uh, A, um, Title Three, um, some of our special education grants. Um, and lastly, there's there's Metco. Um, same thing with Metco is, is um, once we start drawing down, the, once we start uh, expending the funds, we start drawing down those amounts, and so the revenue projections should go down. And then the last page, page 15, 13. I mean, sorry, excuse me, page 15 is just a continuation of the ESSA grant. Um, you'll notice that the the awarded amount will be when we first award the grant, and then I'm just tracking down the, the actuals and the covered and the projection of what we anticipate for the remainder of the year. Um, so I went back kind of fast. If you have any questions, feel free to send them my way. Sure. Ms. Morgan. Yeah, so um, 520518, the instructional materials line, um, has a huge, like 463,000 left over. Um, which seems like a lot um, when we're rolling out a new curriculum this year. Um, and so uh, the challenging bit is, is that we kind of need that number to be big because there's the bottom line number is only 134,000, <laughs> right? And I, I don't know, I, I just don't know why we're, I don't know why there's so much money left in that line item sure. when we're rolling out a new curriculum. Sure, can you read the number again? Sorry, five. Uh, instructional materials, 520-518. Yeah, so 
Um, it's a combination of a lot of a lot of the the, the expenditures that is encumbered, and we also have a, a deadline of when we want everything by for the end of the year. Um, even though, so the hope the hope we have when we set deadlines is more about hopefully everyone what everyone needs for the end of the year gets encumbered early, um, and then afterwards, if there's anything late or if there's any emergency spending, then we we try to uh, cover that. And so, with this reflects here, the projection is a bit lower mainly because we encumbered most of the funds dedicated to that object line, if that makes sense. It makes, so it makes sense from a budgetary standpoint, kind of. What I guess I'm asking more of a like, I'm whoop, going up a little bit higher, and I'm like, hey, so we budgeted all this money for instruct, well, not all this money, we budgeted money <laughs> for instructional <laughs> materials that we um, have not spent, nor have we encumbered it. I, th I think and Dr. Ford Walker would like to. I would take thank a you. Stab <laughs> Don't worry, that, that yes. money's going to be spent. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been in the process of finalizing um, the instructional materials, the numbers um, at every grade level um, across the school. So our coaches have been working on finalizing the actual materials, but then also working on um, finalizing the platform that we're going to be using um, to not just access the materials, but to access some of the additional materials that come with the curriculum. And so we're just finalizing numbers, um, but the money's gonna be spent and the materials are gonna start to be ordered middle of May. Okay, so then, so then, now, yay, buying things, but that $463,000 positive number in there is offsetting a lot of other accounts that are are negative and the bottom line number is a hundred and thirty four thousand so as if we spend the whole 463 I mean again it, I'm picking on instructional materials because like they're deeply important to me and they're so important to what we do obviously and it's not a place that I want to like be I don't want to see us not spending and if all of that gets spent we will actually be have will be negative at the end of the at the end of the year like w there's so the, the all of those accounts sum up to right now projecting 135,000 positive at the end of the year but that's assuming that we leave $464,000 on the table for instructional materials so once we start spending that down something else in another just that's just the math to make sure that that bottom corner is positive at the end. Yeah, because of all, we're also, we have in process transfer for curriculum, curriculum related expenditure for 200,000, so that 200,000 should be inclusive as well, if that makes sense. So, so well, let, let me ask one, one question, and I, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. I mean, we had the override, and there was, there is a, a, an adjustment for this year because we brought it in for uh, salary negotiations for a couple of units. So has that money been drawn into the budget there, at this yeah, point? It's yeah. already there. Okay, oh, yeah. fine. Okay. I just want to make sure that number was in there. And on the curriculum items, um, we do have the practice of replenishing our consumables within the curriculum toward the end of the year, so some of that money that's sitting in curriculum right now is for replenishment? Yes, and, and let me just clarify. So um, and the $200,000 um, that Jose is mentioning is um, part of a grant that the district received for high quality instructional materials. So all of that $200,000 will go towards EL supplies and materials. Um, in addition, to this doesn't include once we hit the summer, right, in July 1st, and we roll over to the new year, and then there are other materials that need to be ordered with starting then. But um, out of that $400,000, all of that will not be used to purchase the materials. $200,000 is earmarked. And then from there, I believe we only have access to 100000 yeah. somewhere around there. So in terms of your other question, that will not all be used by instruction materials. I don't have the final numbers. That was something I looked to Jose to provide. Um, yeah. That, hopefully that's a little clear. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll go on to the superintendent's report. Okay. 
Um, I'll be providing the superintendent's report for Dr. Holman this evening. And I'd like to start off by sharing um, an update on some of our administrative hiring searches. Uh, so currently we have a few hiring searches that are currently in progress. Um, we're running a search for the K-12 math director and the OMS assistant principal. We've completed the search for an assistant principal at Bishop's School. We're excited to welcome Kathleen Early. Welcome to Arlington. Um, also, uh, we've completed the Hardy School Principal Search, which Dr. Holman shared um, when she was here at the last meeting, and want to again welcome Gretchen Saunders to Arlington. Uh, Dr. Holman will be making an announcement soon as it relates to our Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations search. And finally, we have an upcoming search for the Director of History and Social Studies, um, and we will begin that search within the next couple of weeks. We are excited to share that we've been awarded the Teacher Diversification Grant from DESE to help support our efforts to support the recruitment and retention of diverse educators. Um, and this includes a $15,000 grant to APS to work with um, two local colleges to help support five to seven APS educators with emergency licensure, um, and as well as MTEL and other areas. And I'd like to highlight Bishop School, who had their science night last night. It was, it was a successful evening. Um, there were a number of students and families in attendance, and they had an opportunity to engage in science, content, experiences, and have a lot of fun. Um, we have a few upcoming events. Um, one was mentioned already. We have our students who will be performing at Carnegie Hall tomorrow evening, students from our performing arts department. Um, also, we have a performance of Mean Girls Junior Play taking place at Audison Middle School tomorrow at 7 p.m. Oh, the high school, excuse me. Um, also, on May 18th, we'll have our second annual Pride celebration, um, and this will take place here at the high school, the front lawn outside. There'll be a lot of music, arts and crafts, fun and activities, and also an, a time to come together as a community and celebrate. And finally, uh, Dr. Holman uh, has updated the enrollment reports, and those are in Novus. And if you have any questions about those, please uh, see Dr. Holman with those questions. And that concludes my superintendent's update. Ms. Medeiros. Yeah, just real quick on, on Mean Girls. So the Audison musical is actually, they had to change it to 7.30 tomorrow because of the junior prom. Um, but it's also 7 o'clock on Saturday. So mm -hmm. there's a second Thank performance you. then as well. And you're taking advantage of the new stage of the high school. So they are. I'm actually not involved anymore, but um, mm -hmm. you people. But yes, they are. They're using that beautiful space. So you want to come? If you want to see them, you're not going to the Odyssey. You're coming right here. Yes. No more gym. <laughs> That's great. A lot of drive. That's great. Uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant 24263, dated 41724, in the amount of $740,437.12. School committee meeting minutes for the organizational meeting and the regular meeting. April 11th, 2024, and a field trip for the National History Day competition. Motion to approve the uh, consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded and by second. Ms. Gittleson. All, any discussion? Well, no discussion. It's an, it is a consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That is a five-nothing five vote. Um, and it is unanimous. Super, uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Uh, budget, Dr. Allison Appy. Um, we'll be scheduling a meeting soon. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Uh, we will also be scheduling a meeting soon. Okay. Curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability, Ms. Morgan. We're actually not sure if we're going to have a meeting uh, soon. <laughs> <laughs> you, you run the best meetings. You should have one. Well, well yeah, we're, yes. We're, <laughs> we're actually trying to figure that out. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thielman is not with us for facilities. Is there, uh, do you know, 
Dr. Allison Appy, if there's anything going on there. You're, you're on facilities, are you? No. I am. Okay. Policies and procedures. Mr. Cardin's not here. I'm sure that there's work to be done there. The Bill, Arlington High School Building Committee. Uh, Mr. Thielman is not here. Dr. Allison Appy would probably know if there's something we need to know about. Nothing that you need to know about. Okay. We also have uh, some sketches of uh, plans for new seating for the room, which we'll share with you and get a comment on. Um, liaison reports. Anyone with a liaison report? Seeing none announcements. Future agenda items. We've received correspondence from Arlington High School student, and I just lost it. Um, my uh, Alexandra Lay. Alexandra Lay, there she is. Alexandra Lay wrote to us. Uh, they are looking to do a climate resilient schools coalition project and possibly a resolution coming from us or them or somewheres. And they like to talk to at least some of us. So I suggest a subcommittee might want to play with that. So do I have a motion to deposit it in some subcommittee for discussion with this wonderful student? Motion Ms. Exton. to refer this to the community relations subcommittee. Okay, motion by Ms. Exton to refer to community relations, seconded by? Second. Uh, Ms. Gittleson, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? That is a 5 nothing unanimous vote. Uh, I'm sure that that'll be joyous. Um, any other future agenda items? So next we are heading towards executive session. So I will entertain a motion to enter executive session to conduct, conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, specifically for the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares, and as the chair I so declare that it would have a detrimental effect to do that in public session. Motion by? We will return. And we will return to public session after, after the executive session. Um, and motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, second by? Second. Ms. Exton, roll call, Ms. Exton? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. That's a five nothing roll call vote, and we are now in executive session. It is now 7.52. We are back from executive session. We are in open session. We have before us a proposed employment agreement between the Arlington School Committee and Francis Gorski, who would become our Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, effective July 1st, 2024. The contract is before us. It was voted in executive session and we are returning to uh, public session in order to vote it in public. So the motion would be to approve the contract and authorize the chair to sign it on behalf of the school committee. Motion by? So moved. Okay, motion by uh, Ms. Morgan, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, that is a 5 nothing vote. It is unanimous. Dr. Holman, comment, please. Sure. So thank you, uh, Mr. Schlickman, and thank you, members of the school committee um, and everybody in the Arlington community who participated in the interview process. We had uh, Mr. Gorski was among a few candidates that we interviewed initially, and then we brought him in for a final round where he completed a performance task, met with the central office, members of school committee, uh, members of the administrative team and, and inter had an interview with members of the cabinet team. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in public school finance. 
um, and was most recently the chief financial officer for the Somerville Public Schools. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge about school finance to the Arlington Public Schools. And we're very much looking forward to all he will contribute to our system and our teams. Uh, he regrets that he wasn't able to be here tonight. He had budget meetings this evening himself, um, but I let him know that we would be sure to bring him back and have him share elements of his transition plan and get to meet everybody over the next several months. Uh, the contract is, has him starting on July 1st, and we will be definitely having him in sooner than that to take a look at things and get to meet the team uh, and begin some of the work and also make sure that uh, Somerville has what they need as they close out the school year. So we're really excited um, to have Mr. Gorski joining us, um, bringing all of the knowledge that he will bring, and the team is looking forward to having him um, with us in, in July. So thank you so much for your support, uh, for participating in the interview process, and there will be more information to come. On behalf of the committee, we thank everybody who participated in the hiring process, and we are happy with the positive outcome. Any other questions or comments from the committee? He hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So moved. Moved by Ms. Morgan, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Everybody's smiling. All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstentions? That is a 5 nothing unanimous vote, and we are adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.